San Lazaro was a modern, attractive city popular for its west coast location and diverse population. It was also the epicenter of a cybernetic tech revolution which had impacted virtually everyone on the planet. The winter of 2050 was unusually mild, a perfect breeding ground for the latest bout of avian flu. The virus mutated rapidly. Even the elite team of scientists sent to deal with the outbreak were helpless. The city was quarantined within a week. At first, the citizens went about their daily lives as before, hoping they wouldn't contract the flu. Then all of a sudden, at the end of the second week, all of the high-level city officials, law enforcement evacuated overnight and the citizens were left to fend for themselves. All while, rumors spread quickly about some cyber mimetic sociopaths on the streets who had begun to attack and murder the city's residents indiscriminately. Welcome, folks. Today, the Hungry Gamer previews Omicron Protocol, a new skirmish miniatures game coming to Kickstarter on May 20th. Now, I myself am not a huge player of skirmish miniature games, so a lot of this was new to me, but I suspect for those of you that are very familiar with the genre, you're going to see that some of the things are new and exciting and different, and it really does make this game unique. So the purpose of the game is you are battling another faction trying to accomplish some kind of objective, and it changes with scenario to scenario. And in the base box, there will come two different factions, and those are the survivalists and the peacekeepers. And you will also be able to get as add-ons in the Kickstarter two other factions called the Red Dragons and the Animal. And let me give you an idea of what those look like right now. So each faction will come with six different characters in it. And here we have the survivalists, which are your run-of-the-mill apocalypse zombie preppers. And I do have to say, this is the thing that pisses me off the most about this game, is because this game is really giving credence to the fact that, nope, these people were right. And that is just the worst. But very cool art, very cool characters here. Then you have the peacekeepers. And these represent various law enforcement or government agents of various types that were in San Lazaro when the evacuation came. Then we have the animals, and I think it's pretty clear that they are literally animals with cybernetic enhancements. I actually have no idea what it is that they are doing in this game. I can only assume that the elephant leads them and they are looking for peanuts. I have no idea. And then we have the Red Dragon faction, which my understanding is that they are doing their best to take advantage of the chaos in the city and to get out of there with as much money and loot as possible. And so those are your four factions that will be available at the end of the Kickstarter. Now, before I dive any more into this, uh, let's take a look at how the game plays. Okay, so here I have set up the intro how to play scenario, but I've added a couple of modifications to kind of get a few more of the details of the game uh, as I play through. And usually you play either three rounds in a short game or five or six rounds in a long game with the caveat that if anybody scores three points, then the end of the next round will be the end of the game. But for today, I'm just going to play through one round, set up as a short game with two characters from each, fa each faction. And I'll just zoom in here a little bit so you can see a little better, because as you can see, there's quite a lot here on the table. Down here, I have my two characters from the survivalist faction. And this is a good time to point out that each faction has their own special ability, and you can track here their victory points as you go on. And usually you would have these in a sleeve or laminated and you would just mark on them with a uh, dry erase. I don't have those, so I'll just be using a die to track it if I happen to uh, get any points in this first round. And then my other faction is the Peacekeepers. If you look at the card, you'll see that each one does have their own special ability and they each have their own once per game ability. Um, I probably won't use the once per game abilities in this brief one round play that I do, but it is there and you can check it out and I will do my very best to point out when I'm using the all the time abilities. Then for my survivalists, I have two characters. The first is Thug here, and he is a relatively quick moving melee only well, thug. And as you can see here on his card, and I will explain some of this later, you have uh, up here, you have the stats, he can walk for three, run for five. He has an attack of six, a dex of two, and a luck of five. And then I have Seeker, who is a little bit faster, a little bit squishier, with a walk of five, a run of seven, attack of four, a dex of four, and a luck of five, and can do melee 
or ranged attacks. And then on my Peacekeeper side, I have Pi, who again has their, her own special abilities over here. You can see the stats up there and is both melee and ranged. And then I have Buck, who again is melee and ranged. But the big thing here is Buck actually has a shotgun that has an area of effect. And hopefully we'll see that in this first round that I play. Additionally, on the setup, each character gets an item. And both my survivalists wound up with this blue cow energy drink, which lets them move a little further. And Buck wound up with this cone of silence, which can immediately reduce the noise that he generates. We'll talk about noise in a little bit. And Pi has a pot lid, which is when a non-friendly model declares an attack against it, I can use it and it will reduce incoming damage by one. And so what I have out here on the map, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, is I have my two survivalists over here. We have Thug, and you see it's a pretty cool mini there. I wish it would focus for me. And we have Seeker. Again, also a nicely painted mini. On this side, we have Buck. Again, I apologize, it's not zooming in. And Pi, right here. And again, these are nice minis, very well painted in this uh, prototype I have. This is a good time for me to point out that this is a prototype version of the game. I have a prototype mat, prototype minis, and many of the characters, uh, their abilities will change as it goes along, so just understand that, but I will still be able to give you a good idea of how the game works. These things out here are various terrain, which would not normally be in this how to play, but I put it out there just so you can see how that works. It increases the difficulty to move on to, and if you're shooting into it, you get a minus to hit. And then all of these fellows here on the standees, these are all the Sims, the cyber mimetic sociopaths that is really the core of the game. And these cyber mimetic sociopaths are basically technological zombies. And the idea in this game is finally somehow a message has gotten through and these two factions are battling it out to accomplish an objective. But what is unique about this game is these Sims here. They're always on the map and they will spawn in most of the scenarios and though more of them will show up, but they will act and will affect both teams. And we will see that as we play through this first round. And the last thing before I jump into how the game works is each character does start the game with a single luck token. And what these do is they do various things from helping reduce damage to increasing a die roll. And I will probably use them as we go through and I will make a point to try to point out how you earn more luck as we play. Now, the way the game works is it's based on an action point system. And each team has five action points and they can use those however they want. The only caveat is a character can only use up to four of them. So you can't have one character use all of your action points. And there's various things that you can do with these action points. I'll bring this back up and we can see. So you can do a move. And if you're walking, as you can see right up here, a walk is a free action. It doesn't cost any action points. Though it is important to note that you can only do one move action per activation of a character. You can run, which is one action point, and it will also make one noise. And that just means you get to go a little further. Or you can do a charge, which means you do a run move, and at the end of it, you can do a melee attack, though you do take minus two on your attack. You can also make a melee or ranged attack. You can draw a forge card. You can do first aid on yourself. You can remove a condition, and so on and so forth. Starting a round, you do at the beginning of the game, you determine who's going to go first. And for every round after the first, whoever goes second, they actually wind up getting an additional action point. So it mitigates the benefit the other player might have by going first. So for the sake of argument, I will start out and I will say that my survivalists over here are going to go first. So in most games, you have a scenario of some sort that you're trying to accomplish. And that is one of the ways that you gain victory points. And as you can see here on the card, there's a space here for scenario objectives that you would track how many victory points you have. In this setup, I don't have one of those, but just understand that that is one of the ways that you earn experience. One of the other ways that you earn experience is through killing Sims. And 
usually you kill five sims to earn yourself one victory point. As you can see, there's only one, two, three, four, five, six of them out there, which means one team would have to kill almost all of them. Do understand that at the end of each round, more sims spawn. Some scenarios have a whole bunch more sims spawning, but that's not something that we will see in this. And the other way you gain victory points is by KOing one of the other team. So let's kind of dive in here. And as I said, we're gonna start with the survivalists. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go ahead and start out with Seeker here. Now Seeker is not the type of character that's gonna be doing a lot of damage. And so I will go ahead and start out and I will use a free action point to just do a walk. As you can see, I can walk up to five hexes. And when you move into cover, difficult terrain, it counts as two. So I'll go one, two, three, four, and I will stop right there. And then I'm going to use one action point to do a ranged attack. Now to kill these sims out here, you actually have to do three damage on one hit. And Seeker here actually cannot do that. And I'm going to show you why in just one second. So I'm going to make a ranged attack at this sim right here. And to do that, I get to roll four attack dice. And I'm targeting the Sims decks. And the decks of a Sim, as you can see over here, is three. So that means I need threes or better for a successful hit. So I take my four six-sided dice and I roll them. And as you can see, right there, I have successfully gotten four hits. Now, I know normally you would think that means I do four damage, but that is not the case, because what this means is I basically earned four coins that I can go spend in my market here. And in my market, on a ranged attack, I can spend one hit, and that does one wound. Well, that doesn't actually help me very much. But I also have all of these other abilities down here. I can do a steal, a sidestep, place a snare, or another sidestep, a sidestep for two, a sidestep for one. You can only do each one of these once per turn. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use three of my hits to place a snare. And so I have my snare, and I can place it up to three hexes away. I'm gonna go one, two, three. And as you can see, that leaves me with this one other success, which happens to be a six. Now I mentioned at the beginning there is luck, and Seeker's luck is five plus. So that means any unspent success that I have, I can spend on a luck token. And so I will do that. I will spend this, and I will earn myself one more luck. And I have now spent one of my five action points. Now, the next thing that is important is I fired, and we mentioned earlier in the game the concept of noise. And you'll notice that this gun here has a noise of zero, which seems odd, but that's because of this passive ability that Seeker is stealthy. This model may make no noise when moving or making an attack. And so that's what I'm going to do, because she's not particularly tough and sturdy. And I'm going to say that's the end of Seeker's turn. I moved her into a position where she has some cover, and I threw down a snare that will mess with the other team. Now I'll move on to my peacekeeper side. And the thing about the peacekeepers is they get plus one attack die for every range attack that they make. And it also says reduce the penalty of cover to uh, minus one. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start out and I'm gonna activate Buck here. And here's Buck's card. I'm going to do a run. So I use one action point, and I do a run, which means I can go five, and I go one, two, three, four. And I'm gonna move myself to there. The reason I did that is because if I had crossed through that hex right there, I would have been attacked by the other, uh, by this uh, sim right here. And then I'm going to spend two more action points to use my shotgun. And I have these two templates here. And I will use this right here. And of course, it is important to note that one of the stretch goals in the campaign is going to be to get acrylic versions of these so they are clear and you can see through them. And again, as I said, just another reminder, this is just a prototype version. And so I put it on the green right here, and that gives me a blast, which would hit those two sims. 
Now, the ranged AOE works a little bit differently than the ranged attack. I already showed you how that ranged attack works over there. The AOE, you roll one die per model hit. So I have two of them that were hit, and then I'm rolling two dice against their decks. And their dex is three, so that is one hit here. And then I'm going to use this luck token, and as I mentioned, you can change dice, and increase the value of this die to a three, which means both of them have been hit. And if you look at Buck's card here, it says that Sims hit are KO'd. So I don't have to buy a certain amount of damage. They are just immediately KO'd. I'm going to take both of these and I'm just going to put them on my card over here to track that I've taken out two of them and I'm well on my way towards getting an XP. Now I have two actions left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use another one and I'm going to have Buck fire over here at that other target. And Buck has an attack of five, but if we remember our Peacekeeper ability gives me one extra die. So I will be rolling six dice and I'm versus a dex of three. And so I have three successes right here. And the other three are completely useless to me, so I'll just put those aside. And now I get to go to my market here and see what there is to purchase. So right here, I can, for one coin I have, I can do one damage. For two, I can do two damage. However, I'm looking to do a total of three damage. And to get a three damage, I need five successes. So there's actually not very much that I can do there. What I can do, however, is I can spend that three right down here and do a shift of one space. And so I'm gonna make that purchase and shift myself into the cover. If that is something that's not actually allowed, you can't shift in the cover, uh, I'm sure Bernie will let me know and I'll put that correction in the Klingon subtitles. And that must be the end of Buck's turn because I only have one action point left. And as I said, you can only spend a maximum of four on a character. Now I go back to my survivalists and I have Thug. And Thug has four actions which he can spend. Let me rewind a little bit. I almost forgot that I fired twice with my shotgun here. And my first thing I did gave me a noise of three, and my second shot also gave me a noise of three. That means that Buck here has generated six noise. Now normally, at this point, I would probably use this ability and reduce my noise level. However, so you get an idea of how these sims work, I'm not going to do that, and I'm gonna show you right now. I made a mistake and did not do this last time, because Seeker actually earned no noise, so nothing would have happened. What's gonna happen now is at the end of Buck's turn here, every Sim within six hexes will be activated. And so that's this one, one, two, three away, one, two, three, four away, one, two, three, four, five away. So all of those are going to activate. Now if we go back here and we look at our dice, the Sims will each move two and have an attack of two. And what's interesting here is that it is the other player that gets to decide how and where they're going to move. And also important note about the Sims is they are not affected by cover. They can walk on it, walk through it, and they take no minuses, nor do they gain any bonuses from cover. But so we'll start with this one here. We'll go one, two, and we'll then attack Buck for two attack dice. And we are facing Buck's defense, uh, decks of two, and so we roll our two dice here. And that is a single hit, and that just does translate into one damage. So I will just take my one here and put that on Buck's card so I remember. You know, Buck does have body armor, which reduces any attack that he takes down to one less damage to a minimum of one. So he does take the one damage. Then we'll activate this one, one, two, and we'll activate this one. Now, this snare here is an interesting effect. It is a trap. Now, normally, as the survivalist player, I would go one, two, and move around the trap. But for the purposes of this video, I will step into the trap. And so, one, I step forward, it sets this trap off, 
And what happens is the sim is now stunned. That means its defense would be uh, one less, its dex goes down by one, and it stops moving. And now we move on to the next turn. And Thug, as I started to mention before, before I almost skipped the Sims, has four actions that he can use. And so I think what I'm gonna have Thug do is I'm gonna send him forward and see if he can't take out Buck here with his pipe. So to get there, I'm going to have to do a run. And as we can see, Buck's run is a five. And so I will move forward. One, two, three, four, five. And so that will put me in danger of being attacked by the Sim there, but I don't really care because I'm going to do my very best to take Buck out and get myself a victory point. So that is one. Now I have three more actions and I can use all three of those to attack if I want. And yes, I want. So Thug's attack is six and I'm really looking for a lot of hits here. And I'm going up against Buck's defense, or excuse me, dexterity of two. So here I have my first attack. And very, it looks like it's quite lucky for Buck, as I only have three hits there. And that would translate into, I could only use two. However, I do have a single luck and I will use that, and I will turn one of these into a two. So now I have four coins I get to use in my market, and that translates right here into three damage on Buck. As I just mentioned before, he does have body armor, so he takes a total of two, and he is now up to three out of 12 damage. Now I will use my third action point, and I'm going to attack one more time. And again, that was not great, but I do have another four hits. But this time, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to use two of them to inflict two damage, which will be one for Buck, put him to four. And I'm going to use the other two right here to stun him, which means his dex will actually drop down even further to just a one. Now, I know that would seem like it's an automatic hit. But that's actually not the case. What will actually happen now is just by the nature of my attacking someone who is below his value, I will get another luck token. So I get a luck on this last attack that I'm going to make on Buck here. And as you can see, I did extremely well here, and I have six hits. And that will translate into four more damage, or three more damage to Buck. And that puts him all the way up to seven. Now it also will generate noise. So for each attack I made, that generates one noise. So I did three attacks, that's three, and I did a run, so that is four noise for Thug. Now it's my turn. I get to activate any sim within four and try to get them over there to attack. And I go, I will bring this one one, two. Sadly, it did not get close enough. This one I'll have attack Thug. And as a reminder, Thug's dex is a two, so I'm looking for twos or better. And Thug will take two damage, which gives him two out of uh, his 16. However, one of the interesting things about the survivalists is the first three damage that they take from Sims, they can ignore. So that's two damage on Thug, which actually winds up being zero damage. And then I will also activate this other one, which I cannot because it is stunned. Then I go back to Pi, and Pi over here has a single action. So there's not a whole lot that I can do. But what I will do is I will start out and I will use some of her abilities. She has this ability caffeinated. Once per round, I can use one of the active abilities costing one AP for free. And so I'm going to use this infiltrate. And I'm going to make a target sim move up to four hexes and make two attacks. So I will bring this one, one, two, three, four, right next to Seeker. And I'm going to see if I can do some good damage and perhaps knock her down. And as we look, Seeker has a dex of four, and I get to make two attacks. 
Okay, that is two damage. And that is two more damage. So Seeker actually just took four out of her six damage. So she is actually in a bad way. And then that leaves me with one action left. Now it looks like here that I'm in good shape because I could use my gun here and actually shoot at Seeker. Because one, two, three, four, five away. However, Seeker has a special ability called Hidden. Range attacks can only target this model from three hexes away. So I actually can't do that. So what I would will do instead is I will just shoot Buck there and see if I can't get anything done. And Pi has an attack of four, but because she is a survivalist, she has an attack of five with her gun. And right there, that is one, two, three, four, five successes on Thug. And so that gives me a couple of options. I could use a headshot, but unfortunately, that only works on Sims. So I will spend four of them to do three more damage to Thug, which will put him up a few more uh, damage, but it will not put him down. And then after that, I would activate any sims that are close enough based on noise, and I fired, which means I get two noise, which would not activate any sim around me. What happens next is there is a sim summoning phase, and on most of the scenarios, there will be around the map various spawn points. And what happens is each player gets to then spawn and activate a sim based on how much noise the other team has made. And these are done in multiples of six. So basically, for every die you have out here of noise, that is one sim that's going to be summoned from the closest spawn point to you. So if there was a spawn point here, Buck would have a sim would spawn here and move two towards him. And we'll say that's the only spawn point. Pi would also get one, which would spawn here and move two towards her, as would Thug, one because they all have between one and six noise. Nothing would be summoned to attack Seeker because she has no noise. And the game goes back and forth like this. As you can see, this took a little while for me to get through. There was a lot of things I had to look at and figure out. And that is kind of par for the course for these miniature skirmish games. There are a lot of rules to start with, but once you figure them out, it's really not that complicated. And this game is no exception to that. After playing through one game, I had a decent feel for it. And even though I'm sure I made mistakes while I did this here and I'm trying to play against myself, I feel like I covered most of the rules and I don't feel like I have no idea what's going on. In this particular game, uh, no victory points were scored. I suspect it's possible I might have been able had I rolled a little better to take out a couple more sims and maybe the peacekeepers could have won or I could use my once per game ability but that's neither here nor there. What do I like about this game? Well as I mentioned at the beginning I'm not really a big miniatures game guy. When I was in middle school I played a lot of Warhammer and it kind of turned me off because you had to get so many models and it was such a high cost monetarily and it was also a really high cost time-wise because you didn't want to just have a bunch of plastic miniatures out there when you have 60 or 80 out there on, on the map. So it just took a ton of time. I guess thankfully for me, at that time it was my parents' money and my allowance, but it just isn't something that I have the time or money for at this point. However, these ideas of skirmish games are much more attractive because each entire army is only six models. And when I spoke to the designers, they said that they expect the expansion factions, the animals and the red dragons, and I know they have plans for more down the road, will probably be between $30 and $40 for the entire faction. And that number may go up, it may go down. Uh, please don't quote me on it. That's just a completely rough estimate. But that's it. That gives you an entire faction. And in the base box will come two factions, so you can clearly play right out of the gate. I really like that. I think that's great. I think it is actually an affordable way to get your tabletop battle game. I'm also a big fan of the factions themselves. As I've played through and seen the game played, it's very clear that each of the factions 
while each character is very different, they are all very much on the same team. They very much gel and mesh and play together. At the same time, the experience of playing Thug versus the experience of playing Buck is completely different, even though each one of them is a bit tanky, they're tough, they're strong, they can take a lot of damage. But Thug here, you're charging up and hitting someone in the face with a pipe, well, Buck has a big old shotgun and he wants to keep a little bit of range. I think that is fantastic. I think there's a, a lot to look at and a lot to get from these cards here and a lot of different things to master and try to combo as you have these different characters. So I like that com complexity. I like that playstyle variance. Uh, I think that's great. I think that will really lead to a lot of replayability. I also like that in the game itself, it's not just a knockdown drag out fight. This one was because, as I said, I didn't have another scenario objective. The one that I played, we actually were playing through and we had to knock out Sims. And when they went down, they left behind them a marker. And this marker would only stay there for the round. And so then someone else had to walk over it and then get themselves to the center of the map. And once they were there, they could use an action point and turn it in to gain a scenario objective. And I think that was cool. And I know that for each of the different scenarios, and the base game is initially going to launch with four different scenarios, but one of the stretch goals they have already let me know will be more scenarios, which will be ways that just really change up the vibe of the game, what you're doing, in ways that will really break up this just shooting back and forth at each other and try to get the Sims to do your dirty work for you. I'm also really, really in love with the art. I think these minis are really quite cool, as I mentioned at the beginning. And I also am a really big fan of the art. I mean, just check out these renderings of the characters. Obviously, they're not going to come painted, but they're just gorgeous. And even in the rule book, which I've seen a, a PDF of, it's just filled with this art all, all over the place. Each of the character cards is really good looking. On the back of each one, it gives you the history of the character. They've done a really good job of capturing this theme of this during the apocalypse game with these cyber zombies, they call them Sims, but it's, they're kind of like zombies. And these factions kind of battling it out, trying to survive, yet maintain dominance and figure out what is going on and possibly save the city and one would assume the world. Uh, I think it's just really, really well done. I really enjoy that. Now, the other things I want to talk about that I am just really enamored with are the two mechanics that, to me, are unique to this game. I'm sure somebody's going to watch this and say, no, 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 other games have this too, but I certainly don't know them. The first is this market, for want of a better word. You don't just roll to do damage. You roll, and then you have to make your purchases here. I think that is super cool because, as I've already gone on about at length, each of these characters is very, very, very different. You can spend all your points here for a lot of damage, but over here you have all these different things you can spend your successes on to really control the battlefield, really get an idea of what it is that you're trying to do, different ways to accomplish your objectives. I think that's super cool. I love it. The other thing I really like is this Sims mechanic. Yes, they are a bit of a currency. As you kill five, you get a victory point. But this idea that you really have to pay attention to how much noise you're making, a la Zombicide, is good. But now the way this game is built is you can really use it to your advantage. You can use it to bring these things closer to you. Why are you bringing them closer? Because you know you can get victory points. Why are you bringing them closer? Because you're trying to get them closer to your opponent and keep them away from the objective or whatever it may be. Now, all of that is well and good, except that this is not done via AI. Your opponent gets to activate them based on what you've done. And I like this idea that the higher your noise level, the further out range of how far away these sims are going to come from is. I think it's super cool. I really like it. I'm very happy with it. And you should like it too, I think. And finally, the other thing that I really enjoy about this game is that it's really not a long game. When I sat down, learned how to play, and played through an entire game, we did it in about an hour and ten minutes. And that included learning the story behind the game, learning the rules, and slowly walking through it and asking lots and lots of questions. So I'm pretty convinced that you could play a 
two character on each side game in about 30 to 45 minutes once you know what you're doing. I did ask them how long it takes to do a four character on each side. And they said, once you know what you're doing, it's about an hour, hour and 10 minutes. And for me, that's pretty good to get a highly tactical, very thematic game in about an hour, hour and 10 minutes is just fantastic. Now let's move on to the things that I'm a little more hesitant about or a little wary about. And there's not actually many, there's only two. The first one is, I think it is going to be very important that there are varied scenarios. If the scenarios aren't significantly varied, then this game will get stale. And the only other thing that comes to mind is the Sims themselves. While the minis are great, there's only one kind of Sim. They all need three damage to kill, they move two, they attack two, and that's it. I think that will get a little stale after a while because they're not really that threatening. I know mean, I say that as I almost killed a Seeker here with one, but in general, they're just not that scary. They're not that threatening. They're more of a currency. I think it'd be really cool if suddenly you have fast ones of these showing up or ones that are really strong and take extra damage or one that has a ranged attack. And I do hope that's something that they're going to think about you know, down, down the line, possibly as an expansion or maybe a stretch goal, something like that. But with that said, this is a good game. You know, as I have said now two or three times, I'm not a miniatures game kind of guy, and I like this. I want to play this game again. I am very excited for this Kickstarter. I think it's going to be a really big success. I think that you should really consider giving it a look. It's going to launch on May 20th. So all in all, I'm very excited about this Kickstarter. I'm not a miniatures guy, but I want to play this again. I want to see what the new factions are. I want to experience the story as it gets developed. And I'll also put out there that one of the other things that they told me that they are working on, and now whether this will be in the Kickstarter as a stretch goal or something later on, is a cooperative and solo mode. I think this game screams for it because they have such a lush backstory so far already created, and to be able to have multiple factions working together, or even just play as one faction, I think would just be a blast. So there you have it. That is, in a nutshell, Omicron Protocol, a new apocalyptic skirmish miniatures game coming to Kickstarter on May 20th. I hope it is something that you will consider checking out. And as always, if I made any mistakes in the gameplay, if you've played before, please let me know and I will put them into the Klingon subtitles. And if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe because I have plenty more reviews and Kickstarter previews coming up down the road. Thank you very much for watching and have a wonderful, wonderful day.